Good morning. Finance Committee will please come to order. All right, welcome. Okay, any uh, citizens wishing to address the committee this morning? There being none. I'm way ahead of you. Um, there being none, we'll move on to approval of the minutes from the January 25th meeting. Um, I'll entertain a motion. We have a motion by Mr. Bose, second by Mr. Petty. Uh, any changes or uh, modifications? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item four, CFO report, Ms. Clark. Um, I don't really have any items um, other than the January financials for this morning. So. So for January, um, our admissions um, were right on target with budget, and our case mix was also slightly higher with the acuity of our patients. Um, I did want to point out at the bottom right uh, graph, our length of stay by month um, was abnormally high. Just as a reminder, the length of stay is calculated on discharged patients. So we had um, an unusually high number of patients that had been here over several months. So that is kind of an anomaly for January. This month, our emergency department was 1% over budget. But um, if you looked at the trend, we were 400 um, over where we had ended up last month um, and needless to say it was an extremely busy month in our emergency department but our budget had reflected a higher expectation urgent care you can see um, saw the highest number of visits in our three-year trend in January we saw uh, over 5,200 patients through um, the urgent care and this month I also changed the two right graphs previously I had reported our overall clinic visits and on the bottom we had a indicator which showed more of a it was an overall outpatient visits number and that was a really convoluted number in my opinion it wasn't showing you a whole lot um, it had radiology visits combined with outpatient surgeries combined with a lot of other things that didn't add well together and as we looked at clinic visits we had within this committee several questions about well exactly what's going on in some of these clinics so what I did is I split the clinics between primary care and specialty care. And included in the primary care is our community health as well as the school-based clinics. And then all of the other specialty clinic visits, including women's health, is down in the lower graph. And so hopefully these numbers will be a little bit more meaningful for you as we progress through the next few months. And then you can see that both of these happen to be about 2.5% higher than budget. Um, our, our clinics were extremely busy um, this month. Does anybody have any questions about the new graphs? Our observation cases were slightly down by about 5% from budget, but as you remember, we had a lot of admissions and a lot of patient days. So 
Observation cases are actually inpatient beds. So it makes sense that if you have a lot of patient days, inpatient days that your observation cases may be a little lower because there's so many, so many beds available. Um, and then our invas invasive lab cases were over about 3%. Um, again, um, the highest in our three-year trend. Inpatient and outpatient surgeries continue to uh, be below budget, but we are seeing a slight increase from the prior month. In the psychiatric area, um, our patient days were really strong, about 4.5% higher than budget, and our clinic visits uh, continue to be under budget. Um, again, the budget is uh, very aggressive, um, about 19% under. Our psych emergency visits were 8% um, under, and PHP is about 5% above our budget. Steve, can I ask a question? Yeah. <clears throat> Sharon, on the inpatient surgeries, is that, is that a function of just fewer cases, or are we having issues getting suites scheduled and difficulties with getting people in suites again? Um, anecdotally, I'm going to say that um, we are looking at scheduling, but it's actually fewer cases. Okay. The cases that are needed for inpatients are getting done. Um, if I, I think where we reschedule due to conflicts would be on the outpatient side, and I, I think as we get our um, our new surgery schedules and our new surgeons acclimated, that we will start to continue to see increases in efficiencies and all of that start to work out with higher cases. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then under our financial metrics, we did receive about $180 million this month for the ad valorem revenue, our property tax revenue, and you can see a nice spike in our day's cash on hand. It's up to 248 days. Um, our net AR, continues low at 48 days, which is favorable. And our FTEs per APD is at 5.71 um, compared to our overall year target, which is 5.8. Um, and this is favorable as well. We're actually working fewer FTEs than we had budgeted. It is on budget. Yeah, we are tracking that. Um, you know, if, if just for um, conversation, if you go back for the last two or three years, the estimates are very, very close to what actually comes in, and we'll be tracking that very closely this year as well. So our connection enrollment, um, much as we expected, um, due to the ACA enrollment, the, the de decline that you see here is really um, related to those patients that are insured that apply for our Connection Supplemental Program, um, which they have to re-enroll in the ACA, um, and that is effective in January. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, re-enrollment and as you can see if you go back and trend that we have that natural decline each January and those numbers we do work with those there's a whole campaign that we do in October <coughs> November December to try to reach out and inform um, hoping that that decline will be minimal but um, it, it it appears that that is a natural occurrence in every January. And then we'll start to see that slow incline back up. So for January, um, the bottom line um, from operations, 
The medical center lost uh, $187,000 compared to a budget of $565,000. Um, most of this is due to lower volumes that are um, occurring in the medical center. And um, this month, we did have a slightly unfavorable payer mix. Um, if you look at that very top line um, right here, you can see that our net patient service revenue was $1.7 million behind budget. And again, um, our inpatient revenues were pretty strong, but our outpatient revenue was about 3.5% under overall. And then combine that with a slightly um, unfavorable mix with a little bit higher self-pay population this month, and that's where that 1.7 million occurred. Um, but we do have some favorable offsets down in other operating expenses. Um, you can see that uh, we've got some large savings in supplies. A lot of those supplies are in the surgery areas, as you know, surgeries are very expensive when you start to look at implants. Um, we also have some timing going on with um, some purchases, and um, there's some significant savings in a lab program that uh, we are continuing to outsource. So there's, that's kind of offset in another category. Um, I did want to mention uh, back up in salaries, um, you can see that those costs are slightly unfavorable. However, um, we do continue to hold the monthly FTE per APD um, is at 5.6 compared to a budget of 5.8. So again, we're flexing staff well. And uh, benefits, uh, we were slightly unfavorable in our health insurance for employees again this month. We had several mm -hmm. large claims that occurred. So um, those... Well, contract labor, um, because of some of the inpatient volumes that we're seeing, um, some, of, some of that uh, is creating contract labor, and then there are also some hard-to-fill positions that we are filling with contract labor. Um, as you can see, we don't budget for much contract labor at all. Um, so there are some open positions. volumes and extra shifts that are being filled, but um, a lot of the contract labor is unplanned and we don't really allow people to budget for that. So that's just kind of a natural overage. And then as those positions get filled from a full-time status, you'll hopefully see that go down. Are there any questions on the month of January? If you look at year to date, um, the medical center is at 1.3 million year to date, um, 2.3 million budget. So we're about a million dollars behind for the four months on um, income from operations. Our net income is at three and a half million so far. Um, the differential there is really our mark to market on our investments. Hopefully by year end, that will correct itself. We're all hoping for that. Yeah. So a claim, um, they continue to be about 5% under budget for building counters. That is due to some open positions in the areas of family medicine, neurology, dermatology, psych, and ENT. Um, they are working on recruiting in all of those areas. Our net operating expense per encounter, you can see, is favorable. The red line is budget, um, and the blue line is where we are on a monthly basis. But year to date, they still remain about 
um, 7% under budget on average per encounter. If you look at their January performance, it is um, favorable to budget, a loss of 1.4 million compared to a budgeted loss of one and a half million dollars. Um, again, most of the variances that you see on the screen are related to uh, the 5% underage for encounters. Um, if you look at, again, net patient revenue, they were 11% under. They too had an unfavorable payer mix for the month of January, um, similar to the medical center. Um, their salary, their favorable salaries relate to the fact that they have a lot of open positions that they are recruiting for. Um, and then if you look over year to date, um, they are favorable at a $5 million loss, about $200,000 compared to their budget. Are there any questions on a claim? I had one question in your executive summary. You stated an overestimation of the GME funding. Did we not get some state funding, or are we? So, so the, the way that, let me explain the, that's, a, that, that's kind of a two-level question. Let me explain how, what that statement is talking about. When we went through the budgeting cycle for a claim, um, what we're talking about is the GME funding that the medical center pays to a claim for their time, for the physicians and the clinicians' time. Um, there were, the contract has, has still, is still being negotiated. And there's two components to the contract, and it sounds relatively simple, but it's, it's a complex discussion, right? You have what the hourly rate should be for the physician and what the time should be. You know, how many hours in dedicated time should be compensated for. So what happened during the budget process is um, just as a placeholder, when we created the budget, and the budget resides at the same amount on the medical center and in a claim. When we did it from the acclaim side, we looked at the physician compensation, but what the true rate should have probably been is something more of an academic time, not what the physician was making um, from a clinician time. So we overestimated the hourly value for the GME. Um, and so for this year, when you look at the budget side of things, the budget is going to be too high. Um, it is in our company, but as we accrue for what should be paid, we've identified that that was not the right number for budget, and we're accruing at that lower rate, so it'll be correct when the contract gets signed. So you're gonna have a budget variance, but what we're accruing in the actual column is going to be closer to what the actual agreement, and okay. we'll, we'll, the cash transfer will actually happen. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, no more questions for Sharon? Entertain, oh, I'm sorry, do you have more? Oh, I, I was just going to point out. <laughs> but wait, I always there's do more. That, don't I? Um, oh, yeah, just on the year to date total, um, I, I can't see it here. Not trying to rush up. you at all. Don't get that feeling. Just um, we love listening to your descriptions of our financial situations. It's it's my it's my one hour, Steve. And we want to give it to you. Um, so for net income, uh, we do have a combined total of a 1.2 million dollar loss um, for all three entities on the medical center for the year. And that's it. Sorry about that. <laughs>
Didn't mean to. Sorry to step on your clothes. All right. Um, no more. Any more questions for Sharon? Yes, sir. We, we measure, you know, we measure a claim basically by volume and, and not so much by performance when it comes to the graphs that we see. The question is, we've gone a long time with the claim and we continue to see, you know, a, we continue to see graphics that depict uh, fewer physician encounters than what we had hoped we would have due to a number of factors, not least of which is staffing. So the question then is, is there a way to take a fully staffed acclaim and assume adjusting patient panels to a fully staffed level and comparing that to the physician encounters actual versus potential? And would that help us understand the gap that exists by not being able to keep get all the positions in and get all the staffing done. We can do that. We can give you a projection of what we would anticipate a new physician. Remember when you hire a new physician, they don't come on board and they don't meet their expectation right. immediately, right? Sure. You kind of, you have to ramp them up depending on, it. right? I understand. Um, so we can, we, can, we can do that for you. It won't be, um, we, just, we would need to consider that. We would Is need it, to do some kind of a factor to say there's a ramp up time as we add physicians. Is it a legitimate observation, Diane? It, well, it is. I think, I think there is a legitimate observation, and, and we do track by physician their budgeted encounters and how they're mm -hmm. performing, right? Yeah. And then we would have to consider their time off and all of the things that they do, yeah. what we've allotted. Yeah, no, but we do track it. it. Mm -hmm. We do. But the, the real piece that you're looking for is not the discretionary piece. It's the non-discretionary piece. Correct. You want to be able to see what the potential panel would look like and the impact on the system were it to be Full, fully, fully staffed. staffed. Mm -hmm. the, the goal being to encourage and to make sure that we all understand what that delta Might look is like. yeah. between actual encounters versus potential encounters. Yeah. If it's not a huge deal, okay. I'd be interested in seeing okay. it. If it is a huge deal, then we'll, we'll work on we can it. talk offline or yeah. whatever. Well, we can work on it. Uh, it's, I don't think it's a huge deal. Okay. We'll work on Thank it. Thank you. Don. Okay. Thanks, Trent. Any other questions for Sharon? I'd like to entertain a motion to accept the CEFO's report. Motion by Mr. Bose. Second by Dr. Weber. Any further questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Report is accepted. Thank you. Thank you. And keep your seat because you're up for a couple of more. Did you want to make an uh, introduction? Yes, I do. Um, members, I, I wanted you to um, meet Dr. Kramer. Dr. Kramer is um, med exec's appointee to this committee. He's going to um, sit in on this committee. And I wanted you to, to, to know him. Uh, Dr. Kramer is also part of our OBGYN department. He's an acclaimed doctor doing a great job for us. And so I didn't want you to think that um, he was just here because he had nothing else to do. Uh, <laughs> he has a lot to do. So I wanted to introduce him to y'all. And y'all during the break can, uh, can get to know him better. But he's a, a good person for the organization. Great. Welcome, Tim. And, and you can sit at the microphones. If you have questions, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. And, so, and you can establish which side of this you want to sit on because yeah. they're, they're, they seem to sit in the same areas. So you decide <laughs> you want right or left. <laughs> we go where we're told. Welcome. We look forward to working with you. Okay, Ms. Clark, item 5B, All right. approval of the network agree provider agreement. Um, I have several managed care contracts to present to you this morning. Um, the first one is Magellan Healthcare. Um, as you may know, we have um, the state has put out for bid the Medicaid Star program um, that will look for new managed care organizations to be in Tarrant County beginning in January of 2020. Um, one of those that have submitted a bid is Magellan, and if they do win the bid, uh, we will be in network 
for Magellan under this contract for Star, Star Plus, and Chip. Any questions for Sharon? And a motion by Mr. Bose. Second by Mr. Wynn. All in favor, please say aye. Opposed, motion passes. Item C, please. Um, the second one is Global Health Holdings. Um, this is a new Medicare Advantage product. Um, this is new in Tarrant County. Uh, they are waiting on TDI approval, the Texas Department of Insurance, so we're not sure what the effective date of this contract will be. Okay, any questions for Sharon? DT, put on your um, mic. Do you know how many lives do they have? Um, we are not sure how many lives will be covered since it's a new product and it has not been approved yet. Um, it's, it's likely going to be um, uh, not really marketed and sold. So until that point in time. Oh, I see. Is there any uh, service level, SLA requirement for, for improvement on that part? Um, I'm not sure about. The reason I ask is the, uh, the health plan star rating is like 3.5 and on the drug plan it's 3 so it's kind of average okay. so I'm not sure if they are flexible in terms of certain drugs and stuff like that that needs to be looked at. Uh, DT, is that the star rating from the, from Medicare? Yes, the, the Medicare Advantage. Uh -huh. yeah, they, they, they know 3, 3, three and a half for the Part C and then three for the prescription side. That's a concern I have because we have some kind of unique patient and if they're unwilling to look at the drug for a formulary or stuff like that, a patient may not get to where they need to be, but they, they know, so I don't know. Uh -huh. hmm. no, new to the market, they're not new in Oklahoma. Yeah, they're the just market. new to Tarrant. We can, we can continue to look at that and, and I can follow up with you on that question. And also, do they have uh, the ability to look at the RAF score? Do we have the ability to do the, the RAF score challenge and stuff like that internally? Mm -hmm. I would have to follow up with you on that as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions for Sharon? We'll entertain a motion for approval of this item. Motion by Dr. Weber. Second by Mr. Petty. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Uh, yes, sir. Opposed. You're opposed. Okay, yes. we have one, one opposition, Mr. Wynn. I, I just don't have enough information because of the star rating and the ability to be flexible with the patient on the drug plan side and all that stuff. Fair enough. I can't Fair. support it. Fair enough. Okay. Motion passes. Item D, please. Um, D is with Provider Network of America. Um, this is a commercial product for JPS. It is a TPA for self-insurance plans. Um, this is a relatively new product in Tarrant County. And if approved today, this could be uh, in network for JPS by May of this year. Okay, any questions for Sharon? Entertain a motion on this item. Is, is there a oh, question? Is switching from a current TPA or? No, this, this is a new product for JPS altogether. It's not like a name change or. Can you elaborate a little bit on new product? What, what is Excuse me? Can you elaborate a little bit on a new product? What, what are we doing with this TPA? <laughs> what, what do we do with this TPA <laughs> when you said new product? <laughs> it, it's fairly new to Tarrant. It's, <laughs> it's not a new, I, I, I do not believe that Provider Network of America is new. It's, it's just kind of moving into Tarrant County. And, and it's new for JPS. JPS. Mm -hmm. Do they have uh, provider network in place or they start the new one? Excuse me? Do they, are we looking at because we need new network, provider network in the network? Or? This would put JPS 
in network for the TPA for the self-insured plans that sign up with Provider Network of America. It's, it's not a large group within Tarrant County currently. But it is a commercial product at commercial rates. Have we looked to see if, how many of the patients that we have previously is our network? Yeah. Well, TPAs are a little bit difficult to say you would be in network versus out of network with, um, you know, if, if you had come before, if you would be in network, we wouldn't be accessing provider network of America, they would just be out of network for us. So they would not have been registered as provider network of America. So we wouldn't be able to tell if they would be in, in this network if they were here before. TPAs are a little bit different than if you just had a traditional um, United or Blue Cross affiliation. So any new provider network that we would be encountering to the extent that they had a TPA, we would need to have a separate contract with that TPA for that new network. Well, Is that right? correct. Okay. Yes. Because they, they kind of go together in this case, right? Well, so a TPA allows, it, it's kind of a contracting organization right. for the smaller, um, and it might link in someone that's outside of the DFW area to access EPA care. Third party administrator. Mm -hmm. Third party. Okay. So it, it, it would allow um, uh, like a bigger geographic coverage a lot of times. So people may not be accessing their primary care here. It might just be an expanded geographical mm -hmm. coverage. So again, these type of contracts may or may not bring a great deal of volume necessarily. They could. It just depends on how the smaller um, self-insured plans access through the TPA. It just, I mean, it increases in network yes. service potential yes. for JPS. It does. Yeah. Do you know how we get to such a low rate? Because uh, they only pay 140% of Medicare allowable. Or a TPA, that's a little bit low from what I normally see. You say it's low? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. usually commercial, these are commercial. These are pretty low for commercial rate. If, if we would talk about rates, we could move into closed. Okay. Would you like to table this for now and talk about that in closed? Okay. So we'll do that. We'll table this item and circle back to it. In close. Yeah, I think any time anytime we want it, which is a very fair question, any time we're talking about the negotiation of a rate, mm -hmm. it's probably best that we have that discussion So because then you're going to provide all that knowledge um, to everybody because in the industry. It's, it's, pu it's published here. That's why I ask. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> no, I think it's fine. I think we can discuss those and how we got to those and why we got to those and what difference that is from um, some of the other payers and, and go from there. It's very fair. Okay. So we'll table item D and move, and move to item E. Good morning, Katie. Square one. Mm -hmm. There you go. Is it on? It's on. Good morning. How are you? Um, I'm here to request approval for a, a contract awarded through an RFP for TransUnion Healthcare uh, doing business as um, eScan. Uh, these guys uh, uh, won the bid against three other um, vendors. Um, they they are an incumbent. Uh, they do a great job for us. They um, do coverage discovery. So what happens when there's a self-pay patient um, uh, later in the rev cycle, 45 days past, past discharge, uh, the patient may not have called us with their updated insurance information. These guys do a really good job of looking for Medicare, Medicaid, commercial insurances through some proprietary software. Uh, they've um, 
found us um, heaps of money, so we're, we're uh, glad about that. Um, so we're here to um, ask for approval. Uh, through the bid, they did offer us a reduction in their contingency fee and um, an annual cap reduction. They are paid when we are paid. So uh, once they discover the coverage, we bill that coverage. Once the coverage is paid, then they receive contingency. So um, it's, in, it's to their advantage to um, hurry along that process so that they uh, fall within the filing deadline. So do they do the identification before we bill the yes. carrier? Okay, so it's yes. kind of a prepay verification no. of, I well, mean, pre-bill, I guess. Yes. Well, this is should be post, right? Not pre. I'm sorry? This is, should be post, right? After. We, we pay them after we get paid. Pay is post. No, I mean, but the, we, the, they identify the, the other the coverage post. before we bill. So they're self-pay patients. The self-pay patient would have gotten a couple of statements mm -hmm. during that period of time when they're looking for insurance for us. Mm -hmm. And what is the day that they start doing 45. This? Day 45. Day 45. Mm -hmm. So 45 days mm -hmm. after the dis day of discharge, we send them the self-pay account. So that gives us 45 days through statements and other processes to collect that information. What we're finding is some of the patients are applying for Medicaid or other insurances at other hospitals or a HHSC field office, and we may not be aware of that. So what happens is eScan finds that information and allows us to bill the Medicaid. What, what happened when, because I think, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the um, Medicaid eligibility contract allowed them for 90 days, right? I'm sorry, I don't understand the, the question. The change contract and the other contract to look for Medicaid eligibility as a 90 days. So um, our days, 45 days, and those guys are still working on it. Who's taking the claim in a week? Whoever finds it first. And um, the uh, Medicaid eligibility companies change and, and um, change healthcare and, and um, med data mm -hmm. are, are not reimbursed for coverage discovery. So if they find an active Medicaid, not an application that they've provided, but an active Medicaid, that's a courtesy back to JPS. Mm -hmm. If, the, if they are working on an application here's, for us? Here's a challenge, right? You may have up to 130 something or 40 days to, you know, you track down the patient, fill out for eligibility, and mm -hmm. apply. And that process may take 130 to 180 days. And here you have someone coming in 45 days, but they may look back further that are actually the work of the other group that, that are doing all the work and they just identify and we bill. All right, so with our eligibility. That's going to be coordinate yes, to so keep people our, honest. Right, so our eligibility vendors um, do provide um, those, that information to us. Whoever gets the information to us first is the sort of takes the credit for it. So if med data and change through their eligibility process, assisting patients with the application, mm -hmm. um, don't realize that, that patient's covered, um, and maybe they get to us at day 50, mm -hmm. uh, and, and eScan gets it to us at day 45, eScan gets the contingency. And, all, and both companies are aware of that. I don't think that's how the contract was read the last time we looked at it from change in med data. Okay. Because they also have workers come and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that will take a long time for eligibility and then here's somebody who just pick up and run through the, the Medicaid or the commercial database and pick that up. But if the patient hadn't been qualified, eScan's not gonna find it. I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? If the, pa if the patient doesn't have an active recipient number, mm -hmm. Um, either with either vendor, they're not going to be able to discover that. Um, it, it, it's a matter of timing because they bounce off of the Medicaid eligibility, mm -hmm. right? right. Mm -hmm. the title yes. seven, uh, title seven, title eight, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. So somebody may might make a determination and apply and went through all the work, and these people can just hit at the right time and will pick up 
Yep. So they, they get credit for something somebody so else. So we look to see if there's an active application from change or data or, or metadata. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it goes back to uh, we have asked those vendors to tell us immediately when that patient is uh, certified. So are you concerned that we would be paying twice? Or are you concerned that they would be able to get the credit, credit for, for it without? And that they'll get us in trouble down the road through audit. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm not but would we, would we actually be in a circumstance where we would be paying, paid twice if they've already, if they're already so, checked so out on their So, DT, med data? remember no, that, that change in med data are actually in our EPIC EMR. Right. So the moment that they are aware that they have eligibility, Mm -hmm. They change within mm -hmm. Epic. So if that's changed within Epic by those two vendors, there's no need for us to actually even go out and use this, this vendor. So the two vendors that you're talking about that are actually trying to gain eligibility through an application process are working within our system and have access to our system on a daily basis. Those would never be, those would never be and those put should, into this right. pool at all. Correct, those mm -hmm. should be, if, if they're doing what they're, they should be doing, they're real time. Mm -hmm. And that, that pay status would be immediately updated from self-pay to Medicare and Medicaid. And we would never go to a TransUnion eScan mm -hmm. to even look for eligibility. So it, sh it should not be a problem, and contractually it is not a problem because that's already written that way in the contract with those two vendors. Is there another vendor in the mix also as well? Because you have a, another vendor that we approved a few months ago that went in and looked at the, the back debt and trying to do recovery also as well. Which one was that, DT? I forgot the name. Is you mean right. bad? That, that does look for. Uh, you mean our collection company? Yes. Uh -huh. Right. <coughs> because I, Sorry. I, I, I know he scans, uh, and, and then there's another company. That's why the last time when I proved that, he said it won't interfere with e scan. But I, don't, I don't think that's the case. Because I've always had problems with too many vendors touching and claiming. Mm -hmm. And then when they submit, and we may not cross reference. There's no way we can cross-reference. So our, our bad debt companies will have gotten that information after the filing deadline. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure mm -hmm. within the rev cycle they, they wouldn't get the account in a, in a timely <coughs> manner. To, even if they found insurance, it wouldn't be billable <coughs> the way the cycle has flowed. Mm -hmm. it, it is a complex timing um, and handoff process. But TransUnion has been the incumbent, and they have, we, we've been doing this um, process with change in med data and with the bad debt vendors. And at least to my knowledge, and Katie can speak to hers on the front line, um, we've not had any disagreements to, to, that have made it to me about, well, gosh, that, that should have been in my contingency fee versus another vendor's contingency fee. So the process seems to be working well, at least over the last year, under these three current vendors that we've had. My biggest challenge is, because Medicaid is a monthly enrollment. Mm -hmm. Is Medicaid monthly, is a monthly enrollment? Monthly enrollment. Mm -hmm. And then once you have somebody, but under the Medicaid eligibility, they only look for those that are already here, the service render, and then the number may change and then leave a certain claim that are deemed to be self-pay, but they are not really self-pay. There's an administrative error on our side, and then somebody went in and scanned and picked that up. So I'm, 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 I'm struggling a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? Um, no, I think. Okay. Well, tell me exactly what you're struggling with. I, sure. It's too many vendors looking at the same thing. Okay. 
and I, I haven't have a clear path of who on our side. I haven't seen the, a clear answer how we're going to determine who. They haven't complained doesn't mean to me that they won't down the road. And it's just, I'm not sure who will take credit for, for the amount of work or do we credit the right people for the, amount, the work that is doing on the self-paid population to find insurance. Because there's at least three or four vendors, five vendors that I've seen so far. Mm -hmm. Katie, have you experienced conflict among the vendors in terms of sorting out the, no, the credit? We, we have very candid conversations about, you know, it's, it's the timeliness of the reporting to us. Let me, let me ask a question because, DT, you are in depth in this because part of this is a lot of the areas that you deal with. So you're going to see things that some of the other board members are not going to see. And you may well see things that we don't see. Is there profit or value to, to us being able to spend a little time with you and understand and, and get your concern? If, if, if there are concerns that, that we don't have answers to, then there should be a concern with the contract. If there are concerns that we can talk you through and you go, oh, okay, I get it, or we get it, is it valuable to take this and, and have some time to discuss with you? And I know that your, your time's been challenged, mm -hmm. but is it valuable to spend time with you and then we bring this maybe back to the full board? Because I understand you all have a time frame obviously to deal with with this contract mm -hmm. but I don't want to do a contract that you've got serious reservations to and you're going to have your colleagues that are going to want to defer some of their opinions to, to you because you're an expert in this area and we get it. The, the, the value for eScan is there. I, I'm not questioning the value for eScan. Sure. My trouble is to make sure that we do our part to credit the right vendor. Mm -hmm. Not, And I don't think we, we, we somehow it's just confusing for me. Okay. to create the right people at the right time because... DT, are you, are, are, after having reviewed those contracts, do you think there's a contract inadequacy in terms of being able to accurately differentiate where that credit should go? I mean, is it is it something that can be remedied in the contract with ESCAN? Well, this, this area is a little bit more complex. I mean, we all know that. So, uh, but I think we have too many chefs in the kitchen to handle. Mm. Well, I, I, I hear you. And, and we may, but my question is, what's the remedy? I mean, is the remedy yeah. a contractual remedy, or is the remedy something else? Um, I think it's more contractual. Mm -hmm. So would it be valuable for you and for the board and this network to, to pull this contract down, allow you some additional time to review and then bring it back before the full board because I'm on the same page Trent is and that is if there's a remedy I want to put it in place right. Right. if there's not a remedy then this may not be a contract that is valuable to our patients and to JPS why don't we, we do this go ahead and get approval and then the next time after we know let's map out the strategy around that so that we either streamline or make it a little bit more clear well, I would go one step further than that. Yeah. Why, don't we, why don't we do this? Why don't, if, if you all as a board feel comfortable with this, you can either approve it or, or not approve it here. But if you do approve it, you have between now and the full board for you to spend a little bit more time reviewing it, and then recommend, recommendations and amendments can be made at the full board level. Right. Uh -huh. That way we don't have to wait until the next time of a contract. We can fix it now. Yeah, I agree. We don't want to enter into a contract, to a contract that have some I agree. material flaw. Yeah. I, I think it's the, 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 the contractual language may have to be reviewed by legal because I'm, I'm not qualified to, we got one of those. to look at okay. that. Okay. Sure. And we're fine. That's, um, that's what we pay legal for, so we're good. You know, well, they're, they're happy to do this. Well, so, I just have a question. I, I, my question is, this looks like the third contract that have come to the board where we're going to be giving companies information at 45 days. It, it, you know, I mean, uh, to go after self-pay. Because this seems like the third. Maybe the question should be, how, how, how many do we have now? And, and somehow that 45 days click in for all the companies that have that y'all have brought before us. So it looks like, to me, we have two or three companies that's working on this self-pay. 
We, we do have quite a few companies working on self-pay because we all know that's our, our right. biggest opportunity. Um, and I can put together a timeline for you guys to, so you can see where the vendors fall within that, that rev cycle. Yeah, yeah. That would help. And it'll have, have, have all the days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And then I think if we can look at the overall strategy so that a board member's not sitting here saying, I just keep getting contracts and it looks like they're doing the same stuff mm -hmm. and to DT's point, too many chefs in the kitchen. Or maybe we say, in order to make this, you need that many chefs in the kitchen for an area that we have significant opportunities in, which you as board members would want us to take yeah. proper opportunities where they come. Okay. So I think Sorry. we can do that. So I, my, my question before you all as, as board is, if you want to consider approving this or not, that's y'all's call. If you do approve it, then I think we have that time period between now and the board meeting to one, make sure legal can get us some answers and make sure that you can diagram a few of those and you can name the chefs that are in the kitchen to use that right. analogy one more step further, which y'all are tired of hearing about. Right. And one of the things I believe when I read in part of this information, one of the justifications for doing this company that we was going to reduce our AP, but I didn't say by what percentage or how many days. So yeah, AR. 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 Right. Okay. Uh -huh. AR. It's going to have some, but, but yeah. potentially have some material impact on the amount of money that we get back and the time that we get it back. Right. So yeah, that's, that's the reason why so we do what this. So right. what it'll help with is those self-pay patients now will have have a coverage that we can resolve through a, a insurance payment. Exactly right. That's why we do this, right? Well, I understand that, but I was trying to find out if we say that's our reason, what are we projecting that yep. decrease is yep. going to be? Yep. It's it's in there yep. as a part of this product, and I'm right. just saying, is, what is the so so this what is, is your a, target? This is a existing vendor. This is an incumbent. So if we were not to have this service, you would see an increase in the self-pay population. Okay. Um, so it's more of a, a strategy to keep that increase from happening because this process is, is currently happening today. Well, maybe my question should be, what is it now? Where, where are you now? You're adding, you've got two other companies. What is our number now and sure. what are you targeting it to be? Sure. That's all I'm asking. Sure. That was sure. one of the criteria you had for going with adding this company. It was, it was in there. I can't pull it up. I circled it so I could have my question, but I can't pull it up on my system today. Well, and, That's and all I'm that, asking. In, that time, in, in the time frame that you're putting together, I think what, what helped me is what stop gaps are in place that eliminate the potential for any duplication or, and, and frankly, if there's still holes. Even after we have two or three companies looking at it, I'd like to know that too. Right. I mean, well, how many do we have to have before we feel like we've actually you know, plug the die. You know, exposure to this industry is that it's not unusual to have multiple vendors. Yes. I mean, and, multiple and it, it does, AR feels like one big piece yeah. of the pie, but we will, we will get kind of a, we'll map it out yep. so that you can understand each one of these vendors is highly specialized and comes in at a, at a different time frame during this, this process. Um, of collections and it's it's a fairly standardized process within our industry so um, give us an opportunity to do that and I think it'll make a bit more sense and clarification. Yes we do approve this and we move to full board to, for further vetting out some of these details. I'll give you all time. Yes. Yes. Now the board meeting. And DT sure. if you could do us a favor and I know your schedule is really tight but if you can give us a little bit of time to to meet with team and express what your not only concerns and issues are that would be hugely helpful for us and that will help us better direct legal and we can do that so the combination of what you've got then getting answers from legal i think we'll be very prepared coming to board and that will give you all a second look at it we'll get wrapped up well, in front of yeah, a couple of things one is since DT is flying back and forth to California we can just fly to California with them <laughs> okay uh, I, don't, I don't know about that, actually. Um, uh, board, board meeting of La Jolla? I like hey, over there. The other, other question, oh, I have one other question is, and it even stuck even more when you said the company is an incumbent company. Yes. One of my con concerns is, and, and, I'm, and I'm asking that we maybe look at the big picture, 
I just happened to pick on you today. Yay. Is that <laughs> that the, that our MBE WBE policy is way below? I mean, we're system wide, we're like eight percent, nine percent. And so I guess my question is, even though there were other, there were three other bidders, how close? Was this bidder to the other bidders, and did any of the other bidders comply? I don't believe so, but I can double check that okay. for you. And then I guess my question is, if this bidder, bidder is an incumbent bidder, and they've already been working with us, why are they now still not in compliance? Um, I think I can answer that. This is a pretty big organization, part of the trans union, so it's, it's that corporate is pretty pretty big, so it's kind of hard to to, to, uh, to pit. I mean, they, they, they're a publicly traded company, so it's kind of <laughs> hard to answer that question. Yeah. Who okay. the other plan? I don't remember. I'm sorry. No. Yeah. No. No. No, I understand what you're saying, DT, but uh, they, they're in agreement to seek to comply. They, 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 there's they're asked to submit a plan on how they will comply, uh, unless I'm reading it wrong. Uh, is a demonstration of effort to include hub SBMBE businesses. So my, my question is, why are they still there? And I guess I'm asking that for every company that we check that, third, that second block so I would just ask that we would look at that and not, and not just be in the mode of just continuing checking the block. Okay. It, it's, um, this, this type of uh, work that they do is very complex and, requ I mean, and require a large system to balance with all Medicare, Medicaid system and commercial. Uh, it's almost impossible for a smaller company to, to get to that size to be able to address what, what, what they're trying to do. But they never mm -hmm. will get there if someone doesn't start asking. And mm -hmm. so that's all we're asking mm -hmm. is, is that we have a plan that says that, that they will give us a plan on how they can do it. None of them will ever do it if someone doesn't ask. And so they are our current vendor, and all we're doing is ask how. There are some of those other specialties out there, but they never get in because no one ever pushed that button. That's all I'm saying. So. Okay. Hmm. Any other questions for Katie or Sharon? Okay, entertain a motion on this item. Approval. Motion by Mr. Wynn to approve. Second. Second by Mr. Bowes. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion well, passed. No, I wanted to pass first. So my understanding is this will not be on consent agenda at the board meeting. Yeah, we'll just we'll yeah, well, right. knowing, Good that, point. knowing that these have come up, we won't put these on. Yeah. Okay. Typically they do, but let's make sure we don't yeah. on that. That's a good point. Thank you. I have much. one other question that, that we talked about every time we have an RFP issued is that as though construction, when they do RFPs, when they come with their recommendation, they have their score sheet that shows how all of them met. I ask again, can we do something uniform so we will get that? I mean, that also helps in, in, in looking at the stuff. All of them have a form that says, do you do this, 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 and this? And only construction comes with that, and it's an mm -hmm. excellent uh, identification. Real quick to see all the questions. Some of them have, uh, have vendors. Some of those have gone out to try to find vendors. They have all that on their form. Mm -hmm. And I'm just asking that we as a board kind of come and look at that when we do RFPs, that that overall summary sheet come to us. Is that, let me ask a question about that. Is there a difference between the form that we would have them submit to us in the case of a bid versus the form that they would submit to us in the case of an RFP? Because I recognize there's a difference. And I thought that that difference was because we were talking about the professional services that would come as a result of an RFP as opposed to the requirement to provide that information by a bidder in the case of a bid. Not that we couldn't get them both, but I understood that was why there was a difference between the two. Is that wrong? 
No, and, and um, you know, we can, again, we can have a discussion, I think, if we wanted to when we moved into close for this other discussion. I think I would be more comfortable there. Okay. Uh, I, I'm just thinking that there is a form that y'all look at that it comes back and that does become public information. It is not giving out anything, but it is your uh, selection criteria that, we, uh, that I'm asking that you show. That is what oh, I'm Oh, the selection asking. criteria. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about the actual form where they produced that said no, this is no. a member it's of the no. form. It's Angie's okay, form. Okay, I got you. And Angie's if we form. can figure out a way to make that apply to okay. all RFPs, mm -hmm. then I think not only is that fair, it can be form. helpful. Right. Okay. If we can do that and, and it is an apple to apple, Apples, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. If it's not apple to apple, we put an asterisk and say this did not apply for this process because. Right. And I think that's a, right. very fair. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Gina, hurry on up here. Come on. Come on down. <laughs> no, I know. You ought to I, I, I enjoy seeing everybody's face out there. They're going, oh, I'm on the agenda, I'm, too. I'm We're buying some rubber gloves, I see. Yes, we want to buy some uh, gloves, please. Um, we have uh, present, we're presenting to you a contract to purchase a gloves from Halyard. Halyard is a previous vendor provider and their current vendor provider for other things like caps, gowns, and uh, so forth and so on. So we would like to roll in uh, the purchase of gloves from Halyard also. Um, just some notations. Uh, they were a previous provider. We did go out in RFP about a year ago and uh, found another vendor to provide gloves. Uh, that glove, once we implemented that product, was not uh, to our expectations. And so we have turned back to our previous provider, Halyard, and this is rolling that purchase back into that contract. Are these stuff parts of a GPO or anything like that, or do we just Yes, go? they are. Oh, yeah, okay. Awesome. Any questions for Gina? We approve. We have a motion to approve by Mr. Petty. Second. Second by Mr. Bose. All in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Opposed? Motion passed. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Ms. Peebles. Good morning, Wanda. <laughs> Good morning. I have two contacts. Sharon warmed up the seat for you. <laughs> Sharon warmed up the seat for you. Yeah. <laughs> two contracts for you this morning to present. Uh, the first one is um, with Specialty Care Cardiovascular Resources. This is um, our perfusion contract mm -hmm. that we use for our open heart surgeries. We did put this out for an RFP. However, they were the only company that did respond to the RFP, um, which is fine because we're, we're comfortable with their services. They do a great job. They are always on time. They know our physicians. They know um, their pump settings, and so we felt comfortable with renewing this contract for this. It is part of our budget. Um, it's in budget. <laughs> Any questions for Wanda? Entertain a Approval. motion. Motion by Mr. Bose. Second. Mr. Wynn, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Item H. Uh, this is for the second phase of our telesitter program um, with Avashur. Um, we started this project back in 2015. We implemented 10 telesitters at that time. This gives us the ability to have um, one person watch 10 different people who um, would otherwise require a one-to-one -one sitter. It's not for everyone, but it's for confused patients um, who may be trying to get out of bed. It's a goal to try to prevent uh, falls on these patients. The person can actually speak to the person in the bed and remind them if they see them starting to get up to uh, lie back down or they can contact the nurse to go in the room right away to try to prevent falls. We currently have a block of 10 uh, telesitters right now and one person can watch 10. So um, our goal now is to expand that to the next um, 10 so that we can avoid having to have one-to-one -one sitters with these patients. Okay. Okay. Any questions for Wanda? You Wanda, is this the total amount or is this just the amount for the expanded section of it? No sir, this is the total amount. Okay. Entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Petty, a second by Mr. Bose. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Juan. Jamie Pillai. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. 
understood you weren't busy with Jayco or anything like that last couple of weeks. You've kind of been hanging out. So that's behind us. Good morning. <laughs> In March of 2016, we had two severe storms that produced hail. Our insurance provider, Zurich, evaluated all JPS-owned facilities and estimated the total repa replacement cost value to be $2.2 million. Subtracting the $693,000 payment we received um, for the patient care pavilion roof repair, um, which was approved by the Board of Managers and completed uh, last year in April, and subtracting the $100,000 uh, deductible, it leaves a balance owed to JPS of $1.4 million. So we issued an RFP and received three bids to repair the hail damaged roofs to 22 of our facilities. DMW Design Group was the lowest and best offer. I'm requesting the Finance Committee Board of Managers to consider approval of the proposed commercial construction repair agreement between JPS Health Network and the DMW Design Group Incorporated for the repair of the hail damaged roofs throughout the district. I think it's great. My question is, is why does it take so long? I mean, it was, this was two years ago, right? Mm -hmm. That this storm actually happened? Mm -hmm. What's, why does it take so long to get this done? Um, so after our uh, emergency repair to the pavilion roof, we went through our competitive bidding process mm -hmm. um, and entertained uh, multiple vendors bids and just by process alone it took this long it's a long time it's a long time to get a bid to fix fix roofs yeah so, while, while we're waiting is there any additional damage to it uh, as a result or just so so unfortunately using this week as an example with some of the torrential rain that we received about three of those four roofs are experiencing leaks So moved. Okay. Motion by Mr. Motion for Mr. Petty, second by Mr. Wynn. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Gentlemen. No, oh, sorry. Uh, <coughs> uh, to Trent's uh, response, um, I don't know if anybody else has experienced this, uh, but I will say one of the most difficult insurance companies to deal with is Zurich. Uh, we just redid our entire church and it took us that long because they sent engineers out they wouldn't buy into the facility so I could relate to that experience I, I know it takes a long time yeah. you have God on your side <laughs> 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 Good we point. have Jamie on that. We have Jamie, <laughs> Jamie on that. Jamie. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Emerson. Melinda, item J. Yeah, I am delighted to be here this morning and see you all to discuss the annual renewal for a product called Midas. We've been using Midas for the last eight years. It is used by the quality department. It's recognized as the market leader for maintaining information associated with core measures. It's how we report our core measures. Any uh, physician measures that we are reporting, any patient safety incidents, and any patient complaints. Uh, a marvelous product that we've been very happy with, and it is budgeted. And uh, there was no increase for this annual renewal. So this is well within your ability to right. approve. It's budgeted. Mm -hmm. so. It's a recumbent, I mean, it's an incumbent provider. Why do we have to have this on the agenda? Because uh, it's, it's over 50. I thought it was 200. That, uh, well, you've got to approve the bid exemption. Oh, the bid exemption, right. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Did we also get the bid exception approved on item H? Yeah. I don't think we did. We, did not. We, just, we approved the motion, but not the. Uh, That's right. So we'll go. Thank you for noting that. Um, we will. Why don't we take up J and we'll come back to H. So what we need to approve first is the bid exemption, and then a move, approve the uh, request. So I'll entertain a motion for the bid exemption. Okay. Motion by Dr. Weber. Second by Mr. Wynn. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. 
The motion passes. Thank now, you very much. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Is it one for a second? Uh, the big oh, pardon me. Oh, yeah. um, and then now we'll actually take the uh, the request itself. Uh, re entertain a motion for the request. Motion by Mr. Wynn, second by Mr. Bose. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. okay. Opposed. Motion passes. And thank you again. Thank you, Melinda. Okay. Let's go back to item H and request uh, consideration of the approval for the exemption for competitive bid. Entertain a motion. So moved. Motion by Mr. Petty, second by Mr. Bose. Mm -hmm. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Clark. All right, let's go into closed and then, uh, wait, I'm sorry, any matters? Yes. 27 contracts were negotiated under two Okay, we're going to go to closed and uh, take up item D real quickly and we'll come right back out. All right, we'll reconvene in open session. Thank you all for your participation. Um, we're going to return to item D, item 5D on the agenda. We've had some opportunity to, to talk about it. Uh, and uh, are there any questions for Sharon before we entertain a motion? All right, I'll entertain a motion to the will of the committee. Recommend approval. We have a motion by Dr. Weber. I'll second. A second from Mr. Petty. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Please note, Mr. Wynn, opposed to the me uh, measure. Uh, the motion passes. All right, there being no further business for the committee, we are stand adjourned.